button didn't do anything to it. And then this one, I, I kind of um, created the bevels around there. And you can kind of see how the light's starting to hit those edges and things like that. What I would like to see is just kind of like a realistic looking render with um, nice composition and nice lighting here. And um, so I, I want to encourage you to kind of um, experiment and try things out um, and come up with something unique. But the, uh, just kind of look out for, for this kind of thing. If things get over oversimplified, it can kind of um, come at the, uh, at the harm of the render right there. Um, does that make sense? OK, so um, let's see here. So starting this lesson off here, um, we have just to kind of uh, quickly recap what we've kind of talked about a little bit so far is um, so we have our objects in the scene. And when I render the scene right now, it looks something like um, something like this. Uh, this is kind of with the more high resolution render. So um, some, some good things about this render and some bad things about this render, which I did on purpose, is like the cube right here is the, the lights kind of not hitting it quite right because, again, it needs those, that, that, that lip on it. Um, also take note that this composition I did is pretty boring right here. Like all the objects are kind of in the center of the screen right here. And so just try to kind of imagine you're a photographer here a little bit and trying to come up with something like a little, you know, visually interesting, you know, so um, try not to, um, uh, I mean, this composition is not terrible, but it's just um, uh, try to frame things up a little bit, you know, like something that I've, I've seen in the past, um, which is a bit of a mistake is um, the, the camera will be like super far away. And then you'll see like a couple of cubes that are just like taking up only, you know, a sixth of the screen or something like that you know so just kind of pay pay attention to composition um and uh also make sure that the scene is lit um and i'm that's something i'm going to go into a little bit here today in the the demonstration um one technique that's pretty fun that i want to kind of throw into the today's lesson before i start talking about um how to set up your renders so that there's no graininess in the renders is um, there's something kind of that can lead to some creative um, renders that you can do for this project that is called a duplicate special here. And so the way duplicate special works is let's say that I have this cube right here that I was racking on just a second ago here. And um, you can use duplicate special to um, make a ton of different instances of um, or duplicates of an object, but you can set it up so that you can begin to create um, uh it's interesting things just with like a one shape right here so just to begin to show it um i'm just going to hide everything here just for a second just to get it out of our way and i'm going to create a simple cube put in the center of the screen right here and so let me just before we go into render settings let me show you duplicate special so that i can just kind of equip you with like one more trick that you can mess around with on this assignment here so it's really simple. You just uh, select an object, right, in object mode. So you right click and just make sure you're in object mode right here. And then if you go to edit, and then you go to duplicate special, and then go to this box right here, this to the right of it. And whenever you see this box right here, what that means universally in Maya is you're going into a pop-up menu that gives you more advanced settings than um, uh, what you would normally get if you just clicked right on duplicate special right here. So just go to edit, duplicate special, and then go over to the pop-up box right here. And what you have right here is you'll get this menu. And just for today, I want to keep this simple. So um, uh, we're not going to worry too much about these controls here today. I'll kind of go into that in the future. But you want to use copy and then parent. So just the defaults up at the top is fine. And what we have right here is the main area I want you to kind of concern yourself with is this area in the middle. And so right here, we have the slider, which is the number of copies. And that's probably the first slider that you want to kind of think about is how many, um, how many copies of this cube do you want to make right here? So for this, I'm just going to, I'm going to do something like 20 on this, just so we can kind of see the full extent of what we're doing here. And so what we have right here is um, we have translate, rotate, and scale. And um, what this is, is it means that each time that I create a copy or a duplicate of that object, 
I'm moving it over by three centimeters each time right here because I have three right there. By default, it's set at zero. So by default, your screen will look like this. And that just means that if I set it like this, I'd have 20 copies of the cube just stuck right on top of each other because the copies didn't move at all. And what I want to do here is create like an interesting shape or something with this here. So we can see, it might be a little hard to see because I have my skydome in the background, but you can see um, that we have, uh, here we go. We have our um, grid that comes in the beginning of the scene. And remember this is measured by centimeters right here. And so this is also measured by centimeters. So for duplicate special, let's say that I just wanted the cube to move um, each duplicate just to be four centimeters over to the, like the left each time I do it. So I'll just press four right here and I'll press apply. And you can see right here, it created 20 copies of the cube uh, going off in the distance um, to our left because I have it going over four centimeters, four centimeters, four centimeters, so on and so forth for the number of copies I have right there. And so something you can do here is you can just, um, what I, or the way I like to do this is I try something out, you know, and then I just press edit undo, which is uh, control or command Z. Um, and you might need to press it a few times or even press this button if it's locking you out. Um, this is also edit undo right here. Um, and we can try it again. So I can also set it to rotate by degrees each time. And then I can set it to scale each time I duplicate it. So this time I'm going to set the scale to be uh, 0.9 on each of these. And so what that means is that it's going to scale uniformly to 90% with uh, of each duplicate that I make right here. So with scale, it's set at 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and 0 0.9 right here. I'll press apply one more time. And you can see that each duplicate gets smaller as I duplicate it into the distance. You see that? So you can kind of set it so that it um, duplicates and each duplicate is smaller than the last right there. So that's what the scale does right there. And when you do scale, most of the time, just remember that if you want it to scale uniformly, you have to set the same parameter across all three right here. And what this is is X, Y, Z right here. Um, so if you look in the bottom right here, you can see this little red, it's really hard to see, but this little red indicator, it says X right there. The green one that goes vertical is Y, that's the Y axis. And then the Z axis is the blue axis right there. So if I remember correctly, this is um, X, Y, and Z. Um, and there's a way to test that. So let me just make sure I have that right. So I'll press Edit Undo. And let's just make sure that this is Y. Yep, so it's X, Y, Z. So you can see Y is the vertical axis. So this time I typed four and then three, and they're duplicating off into the distance this way right here. Um, but we also have uh, rotate right here. And so that can be a fun one to mess around with. So I'll just press edit undo. And so this time I'm gonna set it to, and the rotate's the one like usually when I'm doing this, I can really visualize what it's gonna do before I do it for the scale and then the, um, the translate with, uh, with rotate, I usually have to experiment a little bit before I find something. So, but this is by degrees right here. So right now it's going to rotate on the x-axis by 12 degrees each time. And let's just see what happens here. So you can see right here that I created um, 20 duplicates. And they're going off in the y, sorry, the x-axis, which is to the left right here, um, by four centimeters each time. And then they're going up three centimeters each time. And then I have it rotating. The cube is rotating. You can kind of see it when I put it at this angle, or if I switch to the um, to the, um, to the side view right here, you can see that it's rotating by 12 degrees each time. So I'll just press edit undo again. And let's say I wanna make, let's make a hundred copies this time. And I'll do 15 degrees and apply. And so you can see right there, you can see I'm getting like a little bit more of a spiral going on here with my duplicates. And you can see in my outliner, I'm, I've got a hundred copies right here that I, I'm gonna have to manage right here. but um, you can see in my scene that you can kind of, with primitives, kind of end up with something pretty interesting right here, just by um, going up, selecting one primitive object and going up to edit, duplicate special, going to this pop-up box right here and getting this and just um, don't even worry about these parameters. Just all you have to worry about is, is this little middle box right there and you can kind of experiment with that. So I'll close that out.
And um, one last thing that I think is really helpful with this technique is I'm, I just made a hundred copies of a cube and the outliner right here, which is where you kind of, you know, my skydome light and my key light and my psych are all in here. When you create a hundred duplicates of something, this can get really messy really quickly on you right there. And something I like to do here when I do this technique, if let's just say that I landed on this and I really like what I have here. If you press, um, is it command G right there? And if it's, if you're on a PC, it'll be control G. You see, I grouped that all of these objects together right here. So you just press, um, I'll press edit undo right here. I can just hold shift and kind of select that last cube right there. And so if you're on a PC, you just press control G. And if you're on a Mac, you press command and G, uh, G as in group. And it just kind of puts it all into a group right there. And I can just name this um, duplicate special right there. And there's this little plus button to the left of it where I can expand it out and I can kind of select each cube one by one if I would like to. But it's just uh, grouping things together is helpful, not only for organization, but you can see right here with the outliner, I could just click on the group and then all of them are selected at once right there. And I can press W uh, or press the move tool right here and I can move them all around as a singular object. I can um, scale them as a singular object right here by using that group or I can um, scale them as a singular object right there. So um, when you mess with uh, duplicate special, duplicate special, it's um, just from an organizational standpoint and also just an editability standpoint, I find um, grouping them after the fact is really useful here. It's also useful because if you group them, I can select them quickly right here, but then I can um, uh, press command and D or control and D, um, D as in dog, and it creates a duplicate of it. And I can like rotate that for instance, bring this over. And now I have um, two groups right here. If you can kind of see that right there, let me move my shading back to um, standard shading right here out of wireframe. But you can see, you can get pretty creative with the way that you kind of start stacking these duplicate specials on top of each other right here. And you can get away with doing a lot of this before your computer is really going to start slowing down, especially with something as simple as a cube. Um, you'll find that the more um, uh, faces or polygons that you have in a scene at any given moment, your render time is going to go up a little bit with H1. But um, we're still in the realm of a pretty low poly uh, scene right here, just in this instance right here. So um, just to kind of show this technique one more time, I'm going to hide this real quick. Um, just from the beginning, just to make sure everyone's able to get it is, and I'll switch to wireframe mode just so that we don't have the distraction of the sky dome light here, is I'm just going to start, you can do this with literally any object, um, but I'm just, this time I'll do it with a, a circle right here, or sorry, a sphere. Um, and if you want to duplicate special, it's just up at edit, duplicate special. And then there's this little pop-up window box to the right. Click on that. We get this menu right here. Um, really only concern yourself with this section down here, really. And um, the first slider to mess with is the one at the bottom. And so this is the number of copies that you'll have right here. I'll keep it simpler this time. I'll just do 10 on this one. And when you start off, it's going to be set at zeros across the board right here. And remember, if I if I have it set at zeros and I press apply, it just creates 10 copies of a circle or sorry, a sphere on top of itself right here. So you can tell because I select it like that and they're just all stacked on top of each other. So I'll press edit undo just to undo that. Um, need to do it one more time, apparently. There we go. Um, and it's these parameters. So remember that um, for translate, it's by centimeters. So um, X, Y, Z coordinates. So each time that I duplicate it here, it's going to go into X coordinate by four centimeters right there if I type in four. Or if I type in 10, it will be 10 centimeters. Um, rotate is the degree, so uh, 360 degrees, right? So if you if I do it by um, 45 degrees, it'll be a little bit more drastic each time that I duplicate it this time. And then the scale is by percentage, pretty much. Um, so. It's set at, um, z uh, or I think, sorry, I typed in zeros. I think by default it's set at one. And if I type in uh, 0.75, it means it would um, scale by 
uh, three quarters each time. Or if I had typed in 1.5, it would scale by one half each time. So I'll do 1.5 this time across the board. 1.5, press apply. And so this time I get something that looks like this this time here. Um, so you can kind of see that um, there's kind of like some interesting things that you can start to do with uh, primitives just using these controls right here. So um, uh, remind me again, so uh, for students uh, in the classroom, raise your hand if you do not have a working computer right now. Like, okay, so a good amount of people. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is um, just so that uh, this class kind of makes sense for everybody is I might change the format a little bit um, to where, cause I don't, um, it's not your fault that these computers don't work here. Um, so I'm just gonna give everyone just a few minutes to try out this technique. And then I'm just gonna jump straight over to the um, changing the, the render settings for your final renders. So I'll kind of front load this a little bit. And then um, hopefully there'll be some uh, time for everyone to um, kind of work on your projects afterwards. Or if you don't have a working computer, you can, you know, um, uh, we, we might be able to just let class out a little bit early here today. Um, does anyone have any questions about uh, duplicate special right now? Um, how about online? Is this, um, are you all able to try this out as I'm talking about it online? Can you show us how to open that screen again? Oh, um, what was the question, sorry? Um, can you open the, the, that like options menu, the duplicate special options menu? Oh yeah, yeah, so it's just, um, so I just created a, a primitive object right here and you go, I'll leave it up for a sec. So you go to edit at the top, then you go to duplicate special. So not duplicate, but duplicate special. And then it's this box right here where my cursor is. Is, is that the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, I'm gonna do a quick lap around the class here and just take a look. Um, I think I actually might. Let's see. So I don't know it offhand, but um, if it is. I, I remember thinking about putting that in the syllabus and I can't remember if I actually put it in the syllabus or not. Um, uh, 3D modeling. You, so usually um, most computers these days should be able to run it. It's just, do they run it well? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I guess I wouldn't necessarily need to worry about like rendering something from this. Uh-huh. Just go back to my computer. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Rendering is the main thing that kind of eats up the, the computers, really. Is there, um, uh -huh. is there a way? So when you rotate and you move stuff, it turns it on an individual point. Uh -huh. Is there a way to set it so it moves on its medium point? Um, when you say medium point, do you mean by like it's the world axis or do you mean? Like the center of all these objects. You know how, like, when you have the cursor, you know. I don't know where I, I sit on this one, but it's not anything. It's like in the center of everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. So um, that's something I was going to go over later on in the class, but I can show you that. Let's see. It's, um, it's, so let's say I have a cube right here, and you're saying you want the anchor point, like this this yellow box to be like locked to the bottom of it instead. Oh, or is that the question? No, uh, the anchor point. So uh -huh. you have two of those, rather. Uh -huh. And uh, if you select both of them, right? Uh huh. And you go to rotate and you start rotating it, and it rotates on its own individual. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here's how you do that. So what you do is you group them. So that's where the grouping comes in or another place. So you press uh, Control G right there. And you can see right now that the group has its own anchor point right there. And so to change that anchor point, let's see. So you press D. Uh, D is in dog is the shortcut for it. 
In terms of snapping it directly to the center point between those two objects, um, I know X snaps it to the grid, V snaps it to the edges of the cubes themselves, but I'm not, I see like a little box in there for a medium point. I'm not quite sure about the exact medium point, but you can at least press D and then kind of manually kind of place it right there. And that way, yeah, you can kind of move them with an anchor point like that. Uh -huh. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's keep this going. And um, that was just kind of like an extra thing that could be fun that I wanted to kind of let you all know about. Um, it'll it'll probably come up again uh, later in the semester here as well, uh, briefly. But the main thing I wanted to show today was um, how to render. So um, let me just kind of bring all my objects back that I had earlier. If I can find them. You know, I'm going to do is I'm just going to reopen my scene. OK, so I have a really kind of basic scene right here. Um, and if you remember, I have an area light right here. So the lighting setup right now, I probably need more lights on this. I think I, um, for Tuesday's or sorry, last Thursday's demo, I, I didn't save once we were finished. So this is kind of like a halfway done project, but that's OK. We have um, our sky dome light, and then we have this area light right here in the scene. And so when I go to render it, it's going to look something like this. Let's go to Arnold. So I went to Arnold and down to render right here. And so that's how we get our render view right here. You can see it looks really grainy at first, and then it's going to kind of work its way through it. And um, so notice here that I also have created a camera. So if uh, this is my perspective view right here, but you can see that I had created a camera earlier by going to create and then camera. And then I changed my perspective on that camera by going to panels, perspective, and the camera. And that's how I changed um, my perspective from the perspective view to the camera view. This is kind of old stuff that we've done here. Remember, you can lock your camera by pressing this button. You can do the resolution gate by this button. And what the resolution gate is, is, is this kind of um, grayed out area on the outside. It just helps me see what my composition is going to be before I go and render it. So I unlocked my camera. And I can reposition my camera just by doing um, uh, holding Option or um, Alt on my keyboard and using the three button mouse right here. Um, remember, with the camera, you can change your focal length. So right now, it's pretty got a pretty exaggerated perspective in there because it's set at the default, which is 35. Um, sometimes I like to set this closer to like an 85 millimeter lens or something like that, um, that flattens space a little bit. You know, maybe a happy medium of 50 would be good here. Um, and just kind of repositioning this a little bit. And I'm not going to come up with like a perfect composition here, but I'm just going to uh, line this up a little bit. And so you can change the position of your camera right there. And once you find something that like you like, you can lock your camera right there so you don't move it by mistake. And then something I like in the like button is uh, this button that's right here. And um, what I like to do, the way I like to work is I like to, once I have my camera set up, is I like to just go back to my perspective view, panel's perspective view. And so now I can kind of move freely with my perspective view just by going panels, perspective, perspective right there. And it makes it so I can kind of move freely and look around my scene and my camera's locked. And when I render, it's going to render from that camera right there. Um, so let's go back to this view right here. So the first thing you need to do in the render view is make sure that it's set to the camera and not set to render your perspective view, right? Because if I render my perspective view, it's going to look like that, which is not what I want right here. So I'm going to go to the make sure that that's on the camera view right there. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing, and this is uh, really important. So this is the thing that I think students in the past of mine have kind of missed the most. Um, and so uh, definitely kind of uh, listen up for this one, which is for each light that you have in your scene. So right now, this is an overly simple scene. I just have my sky dome, and then I have the one area light right here, is I need to select each light in my scene, look in the attribute editor, to the to the right over here. So just um, you can either select each light by just clicking on it in this perspective view, 
or you can click on it in here. So I'm going to start with this guy down. And all you have to do is I've actually already changed it here. Um, is by default, samples right here is going to be set to one on your computer. Um, and it's just, uh, it's one. So on the Skydom, it's one, two, three, four. It's the fifth option down, and it should say samples on it. Um, don't get this mixed up with something that's further down called volume samples. Volume samples is a different thing. Just try to, uh, just try to remember the simpler one is the one you want. So samples right here. It's by default, it's set to one. And what that means is your, um, the render times are gonna be much quicker, but your, render your renders are gonna come out grainy and a little gross. Um, so that's kind of why they have it set low at first is because when you're setting up your scenes, you want, um, you want to be able to render quickly so you can kind of set up your lights, make your decisions about your composition. And then when you're ready for your final export, you're going to want to fix these render settings to make sure that it looks good. So um, that's something I need to just go ahead and stipulate right here. It's for these things I'm about to show you. You want to hold off and um, not make these changes until you're kind of about ready to kind of do your final export. Because once we boost up these render settings, your, your, the, your render time weights are going to go up, right? So right now, when I render, it just kind of came right up. So you can see this is like the default settings right here that I have. And um, it's going pretty quickly right there in the render. But as we start to boost these up, it'll get a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind here. So this is kind of, these are tips for when you're doing your, your kind of final exports right here. So um, that little tangent aside, um, I have my Skydome light and I just need to go down to samples where it says samples right there, change the number from one to two. Oops, let's, let's see if I can type one to two. Um, you can move it up to three, but um, it doesn't make as big of a difference. Um, you know, a lot of these Arnold render settings, there's a big difference between one to two and um, a big difference from two to three even sometimes. But the more you go up, the, the more diminishing returns you get. And um, the technical term for it is it's not a, a, a linear slider. Um, it's uh, it's exponential. Um, so it's um, I, don't, I'll, I won't bore you by going too much into that. So anyway, just set it to two. Um, and so uh, we did that for the Skydome light. And I'm also going to do that for any area lights that you have in your scene. So hopefully you don't have too many area lights. Um, I would recommend um, you know either going with one to three is kind of the range of area lights I would recommend setting up in your scene, although you know, take artistic licenses you need. So I have my one area light right here selected, and I just need to make sure um, it should kind of start off looking like this, um, where it says samples right there, change it from one to two right there. And so if I have it set to one, let's just go ahead and I'm going to just show you the difference visually. Um, so this is the default. When I go to render, and it might take one second for it to render, um, we can already kind of see this little middle section coming through. So kind of zooming in on this, this is it when it's set to one right there. Um, and it might not be coming through quite as much over Zoom, but it's pretty grainy in there. So that's what it looks like with one. And so I'll just kind of go back and kind of do the step that I just showed, where I, I go back and I select the um, Skydome light, change samples from one to two. And then I go and change the area light from one to two right there. And now this render should automatically update. Let me just. Um, I need to re refresh it here. Here we go. This button right here refreshes, by the way. Um, and so as we zoom in, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to um, have improved a, a decent amount, hopefully. Let's see here. So just going to give this another second. And so this is only a jump from one to two here. And there's other settings that we're going to need to come into here and adjust as well. So I'll press that. So this is one right here. So this is where the samples are set to one. This is the sample set at two. So one, two, one, two. So you can see the grain goes down a whole lot just with that one little boost. You can also move it up to three too, um, but it's, it's just a little bit diminishing returns each time. Um, 
And also keep in mind that this render right here is worse. It renders at SD at first. And so SD um, is for anyone who's kind of done film and video is, um, uh, what is it, like 700 by 400 pixels or something like that, like teensy tiny, like the quarter of a, a HD render right here. So um, we're still kind of working at a low resolution, but that knocks out a lot of that kind of gross graininess that will come out in your renders just by changing that sample number right there. Um, so next up, uh, let me just take another look at my render. Where, where did it go? Um, did I close it by mistake? Okay. Um, okay, there we go. Um, all right. So one thing to keep in mind too, just to kind of remind you all is just to kind of recap something that was really important that I talked about last class is um, the area lights when you create them. Remember, there's a lot of control you can do with the area lights. So the smaller the, the size of it is um, right here, the harder your shadow is gonna be. So the light's pretty small. So the, the shadows are pretty, um, have pretty hard lines right there. Um, if you want softer edges, just remember all you need to do is scale up your light right there and you can see that the um, shadows soften up right there. So that's very much a creative decision. It's not a right or wrong between hard or soft shadows. It's just how you do it here. Um, remember on the area lights, you need your intensity to be, to be pretty high. It, by When you first create an area light and um, you create an area light just by going to Arnold lights and then area light right there, that's how you create it in the first place. The intensity is the main thing you want to control with it. And by default, it's set up to be, it's a slider from one to 10. And I have no idea why they do that, but you need to set it up into the thousands before it'll actually begin to even light your scene. So just um, when you create an area light, just be sure to type in a number that's anywhere between two and 8,000 just to kind of get it started. You can even go bigger on bigger than that. And once you do that, the slider kind of adjusts so that now my maximum is at 4,000 rather than 10, which is the default. So just when you create an area light, remember to just type in a number right there to get it started and give it a big number. Um, and let's see here, just kind of recapping very quickly area lights. Um, one of my favorite controls on an area light is the spread slider right here, which are like the barn gates on a spotlight. So if I bring it down like this, so that's all the way down. It almost looks like lights pouring in from a window, you know, where we can kind of see the edges of the light right there. Um, and you can notice that the intensity gets a little bit more intense. So I might need to take my intensity down as I kind of adjust that right there. So the spread on an area light is something really fun that you can mess with here to kind of change your scenes up. So that's the spread all the way at zero, but you can go a little more subtle with it as well and kind of get that like Bride of Frankenstein look a little bit if I combine this with the. Um, uh, with a harder shadow um, and the spread. So you can kind of do some fun things just with a combination of the intensity slider, the spread slider and positioning your lights, your area lights to kind of create some fun kind of creative renders here. Um, so, uh, sorry, I keep going into tangents here. Um, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and snapshot this so that we can keep it. So we can kind of see a little bit of our progress here. Um, so render settings, that's what this main thing is about. So um, we have the two lights. I selected each light. I went down to samples and I changed it to two. That's really the only thing I've done to increase my, or kind of boost my renders at this point is samples, bring it from one to two. Um, and hopefully I've emphasized that enough at this point. So uh, next up to get it like a good high res render here is you're gonna look for this button right here, which is called render settings. And it's a little, um, uh, what do you call those things? The um, uh, the, the clap thing. Um, uh, thank you, <laughs> yeah, cue card. Um, and um, it's got like a little gear on it. So that's the render settings right here. So again, it's this button right here and it's right to directly to the left of the um, hyper shade button that kind of looks like a little um, olive right there. So it's uh, render settings right there. And we have two tabs that we want to worry about right here. Um, first off, before we even get into those tabs, just make sure that you're rendering using the Arnold render, right? We're using Arnold lights, we're using Arnold everything at this point. So 
if you use uh, Maya hardware or software renders, those are more old school um, renders um, from back before Maya uh, acquired Arnold for the rendering process. So um, these, uh, these old renders won't really work for this project. Um, Incidentally, if in the future, if you ever try to, and remember, we're going for realism on this project, but if in the future, if you're going for like a retro render, like a, you know, like a 64 bit render or something, these can be useful there. But we're going for realism here, so we want Arnold render. Um, so under this tab, um, all of these settings right here um, are useful particularly for animation when you're trying to do what's called batch renders and you're rendering out like a hundred renders at a time and stuff like that. But for this class, we're just doing one render at a time. So we don't really, we don't wanna mess with this too much in this area right here. Even the renderable camera doesn't actually make a big difference here. Um, you can just go ahead and set it to camera though and it doesn't hurt anything. Um, and again, we're under the common tab right here. So I haven't really changed anything yet down here. Um, and the main thing under the common tab, the thing that you want to look out for with this style of rendering that I'm going to show you right now, which is kind of simpler, is if you just go down to image size, you can see we have some presets down here. And you just want to set, so right now it's set at 540, which is just 960 by 540 pixels right here, which is um, really helpful for testing out your renders because it's really small. So your renders will come out really quick. But for your final export, this is like even too small for like a web page. So this is way too small right here. So you can either type in the number manually that you want right here. So you could hypothetically write like 2000 by 2000 right here for a two, like kind of like a square um, 2000 by 2000 render right here. Um, so you can just, it's, it can't be as easy as just typing in your own number right here. Or you can go under here and find some presets. So for instance, we have like a 4K square, which is um, uh, 496 um, uh, width and height. Um, or you can go down to um, HD 1080 right here. So HD 1080 is your standard um, 1920 by 1080 HD render that you would do for any kind of um, normal animation project, um, at least under the current formats right here. So you can go under presets and go down to 1920 by 1080. Or if you, um, 19 by 20, 1080 is like a certain um, width to height. But if you want a square composition or something like that, you can just type in your own number right here. And um, just uh, remember that as part of the guidelines, I can't quite remember the exact number that I put in for the guidelines for the assignment, but um, you're gonna want at least 1920 by 1080 for your render right here. So I'll just set it right, right there. So that's the only thing I've changed so far in the render settings. And now under the Arnold render, um, this is actually really pretty straightforward right here, is um, under the Arnold render, we have, um, for this assignment, these are the sliders that you wanna kind of be fiddling with right here. And um, what this is, is so camera AA is um, anti-aliasing. Uh, kind of the samples for the um, for your render right here, and it's naturally set at three. Um, and all of these sliders are um, what I said before, where they're exponential rather than linear. So meaning, if I change change this number, is set by default at three. If I change it from three to four, that makes a really really big difference. And then when I change it to like four to five, it's less of a difference five to six is less of a difference. You know, it's like, it's adding a ton of render time, but it's not making like, you're getting diminishing returns right here. So it starts at, um, I think it starts at three. And if you could just set it to five right there. And this slider right here, the top one is the most important of these sliders. This one kind of does the most lifting for you right here. Um, so these other sliders um, are the render quality for different, um, uh, smaller components of your render right here. So um, camera AA is anti-aliasing, which is really important to any render, um, whether you're doing 2D or 3D or whatever. <laughs> um, and then we have these other ones. So diffuse is the quality of the render of uh, essentially like the color of your render. So you're pretty much always gonna wanna at least take diffuse from two to three right here, just to give it a little bit of a boost. Um, specular is the quality of the um, specular highlights in your render. So a specular highlight is like the white highlight you might see on like a plastic object. Um, just to kind of show you an example right here, let me just pull up any, um, 
So this white highlight that you see right there on this uh, material right there, that's the specular highlight right there. Um, let's pull up gold here. So gold, you can kind of see the specular highlight pretty well in there as well. So um, that's the quality of the specularity. Um, I would just typically uh, bump that from two to three. Okay, so transmission, you're not gonna get into unless you have glass in your scene. So if you have a, a glass object in your scene, then you might wanna bump this up. But remember, before you try to add glass into your scenes, remember there's kind of like um, a modeling technique that I haven't had a chance to show you all yet that kind of unlocks the ability to make a realistic looking glass object. So um, you, you might, you, you can try to do glass objects, but there's kind of some some information that you need from me before you're able to really kind of pull that off, I think. So, um, uh, but in the future, when you're making glass objects, you're gonna wanna bump this up. Um, SSS is something else that we haven't gone over yet that um, it refers to something called subsurface scattering. And so if you're in the future, when you're rendering a character um, uh, with a uh, human skin, um, you're gonna, we're gonna use a technique called subsurface scattering. It's also helpful if you're doing like a wax candle. It's essentially if um, light enters into an object and then bounces around and then exits the object. Um, so if you're doing like a human or a clay object, that can be useful, but we're not quite there yet. And then finally, um, the last but not the least on this list is volume indirect. And this is how many, uh, this is the number of times the light rays um, bounce in your scene before it stops rendering here. So right now it's set to two. And so this light is coming from this direction. So it, uh, a light ray can bounce here and then bounce there, but it's not gonna bounce any more than that. So, um, this is particularly useful if you have a scene like a room that's filled with a lot of objects and stuff like that, then you might want to boost this number up. Um, but if you have a scene where there's not too much going on, then this becomes less important. But essentially, this is the number of times lights, uh, light bounces around in your scene right here. And so sometimes I like to kind of boost that up, but it also, the scene's pretty simple. And I kind of want to keep this render time a little bit manageable for you all. So this is a number you can kind of flirt with here a little bit, but it's um, it kind of depends. All these are variable on what you're trying to render. Um, so uh, this the, the numbers you use for this slider right here, the numbers I'm showing you right now, is not going to be the renders you use for the rest of you know your life on the projects. It kind of depends on what you're modeling here. For instance, like I don't have any glass objects in my scene, so I don't need to worry about transmission. But if I'm doing a render of a vase with a flower in it or something, that I'm going to want to you know adjust the setting right here. Um, so anyway, this should be good at this point, and then that's pretty much most of what we need right here. Um, so just to kind of recap what I did to the render settings to kind of get this ready to go, kind of in a, a concise um, kind of list right here, is I selected each light um, in my scene. And be sure to do it. it this, uh, this mainly works if you do every single light in your scene. It, um, so make sure you do this for every light. You go down to samples, change it from one to two, and you can push it to three too as well. And that'll, that could help with the render. So do that for um, your area lights and your sky dome light. And then from there, you go up to render settings, which is um, uh, the clap with the, the gear. And just make sure that this is Arnold render, which it should say by default right there. Under this tab that says common, just scroll down and choose a setting that's a minimum of um, HD 1080, which is 1920 by 1080. Um, and the reason for that is just it gets to a low resolution after that. So it's at the bottom and it's called image size. And we have presets right here, or you can just type in your own number right here. And from there, you go to the next tab over. This is Arnold render. And this starts off, I believe, at 32222 across the board. Um, the main slider, this is the most important that you'll kind of, you can't get away with overlooking is the camera AA, which is anti aliasing. I've always boost that up to at least five. And then these other sliders are kind of dependent on your scene right here. But just generally speaking, you should be okay with some threes and twos in here. Um, and that leads us to where we are right now. So um, from here, if I go to Arnold Render, and let me close out my Hypershade, pull up my render again. Whoa there. Uh, let me close that out. 
Okay, so right now it's set to render from my perspective view, which I obviously don't want. So I'm going to go back to my camera and I'm going to let it render out here. And um, this render is going to take longer now because um, I've boosted all the settings and uh, it needs, you know, it needs some work here or, um, you know, it needs time to work here. So you can see the way you can tell if your render is um, still going and needs time is A, it'll be grainy as all heck as it renders and little blocks will become clear as it continues to render out in here. But also the main thing is we have this bar indicator right here. So right now it says 10% and it's kind of crawling right now, particularly because uh, one thing to keep in mind is I'm doing a Zoom screen capture right now as I'm running mine. And so this computer's having to work extra hard. But um, you can see now that my settings are boosted up, this is going to be, um, you know, typically like a 20 minute wait or something like that on this. So it's, um, we'll kind of need some time to let this render here. And again, you'll be able to tell that your render is ready by this blue bar will go all the way to 100%. And when it's done, it'll just kind of go away. So um, if you see that this blue bar is gone and there's nothing going on right there and your render is not is clear and not grainy, like it's starting to appear in this little small little window right here, that means that your, your render is done at that point. Um, so when you reach that point, where um, the render is clear and this blue bar is finished. Um, the simplest way that you can render this out, and there's kind of some complicated ways we can do this, um, and I'm going to show you the easiest way here, is you go to, um, uh, and remember we're in the Arnold render view window right here, and you go up to file and just uh, save image right here. So it's the first option, so file, save image. Um, the image I'm about to save is going to be grainy, right? Because I haven't let this render go all the way. But I go to File, Save Image. And um, right here, by default, it's going to try to save into your, your images folder, right? So I my project, I created my project on my desktop. That's the 3D project. And you remember, we have all these different folders in here. And so what Maya wants to do is it wants to render into your images folder right here. Um, where is it? So right there. And you can see right here that it says save as and it's blank right here. And this is actually really important is um, for this kind of simpler render technique that I'm showing you right now, what you need to do is you need to name your file. So let's just call this test one because this is um, not going to be finished. And super important right here is um, you have to write um, .jpg for it for JPEG right there um, to get it to save as a JPEG. Um, you can actually kind of save it as a TIFF and some other things like that, but um, it, uh, how do I say this? The color space comes out a little bit weird and you have to adjust it in Photoshop after the fact. So with this particular render technique that I'm showing you right now, all you need to do is, and it's by far the simplest one, is just when this thing, when this render's done, you go up to file, which is the top, or sorry, you go into the top of the Arnold render view tab window. You go to file, save image, and you can save it anywhere, but it should go to your images folder. And I'll call this test one. And I'll write dot JPG for JPEG on it and then press save on it. And so when that happens, again, this render is going to be grainy because I didn't wait for my uh, blue bar to finish. It's still at 42% right now. But um, if I go to my 3D project, go under images. You can see the JPEG shows up right here. And you can see that the renders come out. And um, it's still grainy on the edges, because again, I didn't give it enough time to render. But let me just go ahead and um, open this in Photoshop. And I'm um, right here. And I guess Photoshop needs a second. Um, but something, uh, especially for anyone who's familiar with Photoshop, it's good just to open this up in there and just make sure that your your levels and stuff are good. And you can it's it's okay in this project if you want to make some some uh, color correction adjustments in Photoshop for your um, uh, for your final render or whichever photo editing program that you like to use. Um, so let's see if Photoshop will finally open. Uh, oops. Come on. Okay, here we go. So um, got Photoshop 
Uh, and I can just open up my image. Um, sorry, my computer's freezing. I'm doing a lot right now. You should you probably shouldn't open Photoshop while it's rendering, obviously. Um, so desktop 3D projects. I saved I saved you can save it anywhere, but I saved it into my images folder right here. Got my test render right there. I'm gonna open it in Photoshop. And uh, Photoshop has some helpful tools in it, like um, you have the histogram right here. So you can kind of look at some graphs like this if you're I'm not gonna go into a whole Photoshop lesson in this class right now, but um, you can, uh, if you're familiar with Photoshop, you can use it to do color correction and make sure that your image is exposed correctly. Uh, this image is a tad dark. It's a little, um, it needs a little, a little, it needs a little more juice in terms of the brightness here. Um, and I think that's something that I see pretty consistently with uh, student renders is they, they're usually just come in like 15% too dark, you know? So that's something to be cognizant of when you're in the lighting process to kind of find that balance where things are not blown out, but they're still lit uh, enough. But remember in Photoshop, you can do things um, and it can be as simple, it can be really simple where in this example, using Photoshop, I would um, duplicate my layer. And you can even just do something as easy as image uh, and go to auto tone right here. So image and auto tone and kind of like adjust um, the projectors making it look blown out, but that's because the projector sinks. Um, and get the uh, get the color correction the way you want. You can also do things like do adjustment layers where you um, adjust the levels here. Um, and there's just kind of a lot of um, kind of good finish finishing adjustments you can do with your your project in Photoshop right there. Um, so you can see my render is still going. I opened up Photoshop in the middle of it, which definitely slowed things down, but it's at 78%. So that's kind of, you know, that's the pace you might be looking at for your renders. It might take, you know, like 20 minutes or something like that. And so that's just to remind you to wait until you have uh, your composition set up the way you want, all that stuff, everything set up in your scene before you kind of uh, go ahead and change these render settings to get your, your render going fully here. Um, Let's see here. So, and just be absolutely sure to um, make sure that this bar goes all the way um, up to 100 here. Um, one other thing that I would say here is this render that I'm showing you right now only has one object with color in it. And I would, uh, I would like to encourage you all to just kind of um, uh, play around with color, you know, like, um, you know, I'm, it, mine just looks like this because I'm demonstrating the techniques. But if I were actually doing this assignment, I would be you know, using the hyper shade a lot more and um, experimenting a lot more with the color of the objects within the scene here. Um, uh, let's see here. Does anyone have any questions or anything they'd like to see again in terms of uh, setting your render settings? Um, are you all okay online over here? Y'all doing okay? Can you um, show us how... Um like which settings for the hypershade like to add color? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, within the hypershade, and this is in, um, and I believe I uploaded it already. Um, last classes, um, I talked about it a little bit. And so again, to change the color of an object, you go to, um, so sorry, I'm answering a, an online question for everyone who's here in person. So to change the color of the objects right here, uh, it's this button right here is called the hypershade. You can also find it under Windows, um, rendering editors, and then hypershade right there. But again, it's this button right here. And it brings you to a menu that looks like this. And within this project, um, just to kind of emphasize again, when you're creating new, you have to create a new material and then a new um, color for each material. So you can see right here, I have all these different materials that I've already made and I'm naming them as I create them so that, because you can see it doesn't give me a preview of them up here. So it's important to name them up here. So uh, let's say that I want to end the scene right here. Um, I have these objects and I wanna create a um, red donut right here. What I would do is I go to that hyper shade, which again is this button right here. I go to, um, let me just clear this out. I go to Arnold, Shader, 
So Ar it's in this bottom left corner of the hypershade is Arnold and then Shader. And then scroll down, and it's really important to use this exact one, is the AI standard surface. This is um, the only material you want to use right here for this project. So it's AI standard surface, and it's got the icon with the circle and then the little A above it right there. And so I'll click on that. And in order to kind of change the color of it, you can see, where did it show up? It's highlighted. There's a little yellow highlight going around it up here. So this is the material that was created right there. And this is the attribute editor for it over here. They technically call it the property editor, I guess. And I can rename it just by renaming it right here. So I'll just call it red one right here. And to change the color of it, I just go down to this as the second slider right here. And um, you just click on the box where it says color. And I'll make this a red object right there just by moving this um, middle slider all the way to red right there. But you can see I can choose any color in the, the rainbow right there that I want. Um, and then to apply it to the donut, I have to um, select the donut right here in object mode. So it should just be just by clicking on the donut. Then I go back to the um, hypershade. I right click on this new material that I created right here. So I right click and then I assign material to selection. So I right click and it's this top option right here. So I just hold down right click and go up to assign material to selection. And now we've got a red donut right there. And you can see it updates in the scene right there. Um, and by default, um, uh, Maya in Arnold creates kind of like this plastic kind of surface that's semi-reflective, which is actually a really nice starting point for this. Um, but there's more adjustments you can make to these materials if you want it to look like different things here. Um, and so just to show that in the hypershade, um, you can kind of start messing with these sliders right here. And I would just encourage you to kind of experiment with it to kind of see what happens um, and just make sure the right material is selected right there. Um, but you can also go over to this button right here that says presets. And it's got some pretty nice presets in here. So you can see if I want to make this object, instead of it being red, I want it to be copper, for instance. I can just um, select that, that up, um, the material right here, click on this presets button, and scroll up to the thing that I want it, you know, the preset that I want to try out. So um, I'll just do copper. And I just have to click over to replace. Um, these blend options you typically aren't going to want right here. And I just typically, especially if you're starting with a new material, just go to replace right here. And you can see I have a copper material and it should automatically update onto the, to the object if you've already assigned it. So um, just to show that again for one more object is, let's say that I want this, I'm going to delete this cube back here because I don't like it. But um, with that cube right there, if I want to apply a new material to that, you just open up, um, just to show it one more time, go to the hypershade, which is this button right here. Um, again, that button, you go to this bottom left tab. So not the Maya tab, so do not do the Maya tab, but go down to the Arnold tab, shader, then go down to AI standard surface right here. You can see it created a new material right here that's highlighted yellow. Um, let me just... Uh, quickly. Okay. So it um, highlights yellow, and you can rename it right here. So just make sure it's selected right here because you can select different materials. Um, and so I'll call this one purple, and I'll change the color right here just by clicking on this box next to color, the second slider down, change the hue right there. And I can go in and change like the uh, make it more metallic, for instance, by moving the slider up right here. I can change the specularity um, just by moving the slider right here. So there's uh, the roughness slider. So there's these sliders can do a lot of fun stuff right here. And once you have this and you have this preview right here, which lets you see what the material is going to look like. And once you have it, you just again you select the object that you want to assign it to. You go back to the hypershade. And you find it up here, you hold right click, and then you assign it to the selected object right there. And it should, at that point, uh, be applied to the object right there. Um, 
Does anyone else have any questions about any of this? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so let me show that one more time. So it's um, to assign it, just make sure I'll do it for the, the ground this time is, so make sure that that's selected in objects mode. So it should just highlight with green lines on it. Is that the case for you right now? Cool, and then um, back in the hyper shade, uh, find the material that you want um, to have on that object right here. So I'll do blue this time. And I just hover my mouse over it. Um, and then I hold down right click like this, and then I go up to assign material to selection. So it's a right click. Um, and I'm not holding anything down with my left hand. It's just a right click. So again, I'm just um, finding the material I want to use. And this, and it has to be this window right here. You hold down right click and then assign material to selection right there. 